little niggling of a thought coming up um, about the familiar, that, that really is a good summary of the human condition. You know, even if there's this feeling that there's something vast and enormous and spectacular, uh, the only thing that the ego has to offer is the familiar. Because mm -hmm. the ego will say that the vast and, and spectacular is the unknown, mm -hmm. and the familiar is the known. And that's exactly what we explored this afternoon. The, the I know mind that thinks it knows something, anything about this world, is also the mind, the same mind that holds opinions. It's the same mind that has judgments. It's the same mind that makes comparisons. So, you know, um, it's, it seems to the ego like that's a leap that it doesn't want you to make. It doesn't want you to open up to something that's totally brand new, that's unlike anything of this world, mm -hmm. that it calls the unknown. That's the scary thing. And for me, sometimes I, there's a song that, that reminds me of what you're talking about. Well, you remember Barry Manilow? You remind me I live in a shell, safe from the past, and doing okay, but not very well. No jolts, no surprises, no crisis arises, my life goes along as it should. It's all very nice, but not very good. <laughs> and then the chorus, for the holy instant. And I'm ready to take a chance again, ready to put my love on the line with you. Been living with nothing to show for it. You get what you get when you go for it. Mm -hmm. And I'm ready to take a mm -hmm. chance again. Mm -hmm. Just, you could sing this to the Holy Spirit, <laughs> really, if you really could feel it. You could feel the familiarity in the first part. It's like sticky, it's, it's like the ego saying, no, rock the boat. The ego saying, my world I made for you. It's it's offered you something, and there's some kind of safety in familiarity. And yet, I think for most of us, we've also found a sense of, of boredom in the familiarity. we found a sense of lethargy, a sense of laziness, a sense of somehow there's something keeping us down from our full potential. Something that's holding us back from this bursting love, because we've had glimmers of it. But we have also this sense like, wow, I like that glimpse, why can't this always be the way that life is? Why can't life be actually fun? You know, why is there just bits and pieces of fun? Why can't life always be fun? And the answer from the Spirit is, it is, it can, it, it is the reality, but we do have to let go of the past associations, the, the familiar. And we have to do it to open up, open our hearts up to something that's much greater than anything that we've ever experienced on earth. And we know that it's there, there's something inside our hearts that actually knows it's there, we can feel it. But it's almost like we're under glass or something, you know, it's like we're kept from it. But we know, we've had enough of an experience to know that there's something more. Most everybody has said at one time in their life, there's got to be something more, in talking about in terms of awareness. And we've even seen shifts in our awareness that, that get more expansive, that have wider vistas, bigger horizons, so we, we know that we're on to something big. So Armel was talking about trust, and I would say that trust, as we really learn to really choose to trust, that gives us the strength to start to let go of some of the, the old familiar patterns and to open up to something that's much, much higher, much, much broader than that. 
And we've all gone through that. I remember in the parable of David, I was very quiet and shy and was voted most quiet in my senior class and, and really stayed away from relationships, stayed away from social interactions, just kind of, I, it was a bit of an aloofness that was part of that shyness, you know, like a protectionism, like don't get too close, don't get too close to me. I, I wanted to feel safe and I, I really clung to that and then when I started to get into spirituality, the Course and so forth, I felt my heart opening up really in a, in a deeply passionate way and something inside went, this feels really good. I want to go with this. I like how it feels when my heart opens. So I think it's a very subtle question. You felt a, a peace come over you. You had those things going on today and then all of a sudden that that dissipated and was gone and then that, is there anything stopping me from staying in this state? And then that little niggling thought was, well, it's, there's some things that are familiar. Will, will that disappear, you know? Will, what, will my safe world disappear if I fully open my heart up? And, and I, I'm aware that the way that I once saw the world you know, has disappeared. Now I don't, I can't even relate to it. It's not, it's as if it's gone, like it's, it's gone and, and it's even more so as if it never was. That's the feeling. Mm. It's holes in the mind. Mm. The holes get bigger and bigger, so. <laughs> the Swiss cheese grows. <laughs> <laughs> What you say remind me of um, the the choice that the architect in the Matrix le leaves um, Neo with uh, when he is in this room with all the mirrors. It's like he ha he can take the the door to eternity or the door to Trinity, and he chooses Trinity. That's mm -hmm. it. It's just like it's really seeing that every moment we have the choice and to to really check and see which one am I making right now? Mm -hmm. Am I who am I identified with and who do I want to keep being identified with and am I ready to just to recognize the truth and let this life be what it's meant to be because it's not like everything will like suddenly disappear like I think we make it so much more dramatic than mm. it is <laughs> and uh, yeah I think that it's this the ego is the belief in sacrifice mm. And, and it's the belief that you can leave God and make up an identity apart from divinity, apart from spirit. So that's at the base. If you went all the way down to the unconscious mind, you'd see that the ego is the belief in sacrifice. And as long as you believe in the ego, it seems like sacrifice is real. So in order to say, okay, I really, I'm going to desire you God with all my heart, soul and might. I'm going to forgive and be forgiven and I'm going to come home in awareness to the home I never, never left in heaven and the ego is going to say, mm, well, that's just, you know, that's not acceptable and, and are you going to give up the good things of life? There's good things on earth. Uh, you know, you're going to have to give up the good things as well as the bad things and you don't really want to do that. You know, you don't even know whether that voice is telling you the truth about this so-called spiritual kingdom. So it's like saying, you know, just be careful about that. But actually what I found in my life was the Course to me was just one big invitation. And it was like the Spirit was saying, just trust me. You know, this, these ideas may be, seem very radical, some of them you may resist, you know, some of them you may, you may just push away, but, but just do the lessons and trust me, I'll take you with that trust into an experience. Like for example, when I started reading the Course about special relationships and holy relationships, I think most people who read those nine chapters from 15 to 24 about special relationships and holy relationships, they still are thinking in terms of persons and bodies. Mm -hmm. What they really want from the Holy Spirit is a romantic holy relationship. <laughs> uh, quite frankly, you know, they're like, okay, I'll read your book and, and you know, and it still talks in there as if there's two in the healed relationship, you know, and, and mm. they call upon the Holy Spirit together and then the Holy Spirit answers immediately and then it gets very disjunctive and this and this. 
it's kind of a way of taking you in. And then the deeper you go in, deeper and deeper and deeper, you get certain to a, a, a turning point when you're working with this going deeper. You start to see it's about the holy instant, about the present moment, about letting go of everything that you believe is good and real and true. Like nothing I see means anything. It starts off with the first lesson to try to unwind you from everything you believe about the world. And then you get to a certain point where the ego will go, you, you don't want to do this course because he's going to ask you to let go of interpersonal relationships at some point. Because he's saying the God did not create this world and God didn't create the body. And what's the one thing that interpersonal relationships are based on is bodies. When, e when even you ask people, are you in a relationship or not? You know, their answer is probably going to have something to do with proximity of bodies, what bodies do together, and the frequency of contact of bodies, you know. And if there's not a lot of that going on, it's going to be like, no, I'm not, I'm single. <laughs> and if there's, a lot of, if there's a lot of this going on, a lot of contact and touching, the more the better. <laughs> uh, if there's a lot of this going on, well, you're going to say, oh, I'm in a relationship now. And, then, and, you know, and that implies like a commitment and so on and so forth. Well, you can see the Holy Spirit's taking us to a whole different perception of everything that we perceive and everyone we perceive. Where in the end, we're opening this spiritual vision, the vision of Christ, which takes us beyond the body entirely you know, back into spiritual awakening. That's very scary to the ego. The ego is like, whoa, that's really unfamiliar. That's like totally unfamiliar. And the ego will say, that doesn't even exist. There's just a God and He's going to punish you. And if you're really good, if you're a good little boy and a good little girl, then you go into heaven, a place called heaven. <laughs> he even makes heaven into a place. And if you're not, you're going to go to hell. You're going to get judged and you're going to get turned away. You know, that's the ego's version of spirituality. Scary, scary, scary. But this is the Spirit saying, we're going to take you in to an experience that transcends that. So, maybe we can talk a little bit about relationship that goes beyond the body. Because, you know, maybe you want to know a little bit more about that. Because this is where it's heading. The ego does not like the end. Mm. And so it's going to fight against the means to take you to the end. The ego does not like the Course in Miracles. <laughs> It's like, that's, that is not going in a good direction. Basically, the ego says, eat, drink and be merry, for one day we shall die. You know, <laughs> so, like lift it up because you're going to die anyway. And the Spirit's like saying, well actually there's more than eat, drink and be merry, for one day we shall die. Now a relationship I have found in my life, that when I gave my life over to the Holy Spirit and Jesus, 25 years ago with the Course, then then I'll tell you what happened after that. It's just to kind of ease your mind a little bit, because otherwise it can get frightening. But it's actually been really wonderful. Instead of having, I mean most people think of, of an interpersonal relationship as some kind of fulfillment. That there's something empty, there's a hole there, and that an interpersonal relationship would bring more intimacy, more connection, more love, where there seems to be a hole lacking. Um, there was a, a woman one time who interviewed all these people, and she interviewed single people and married people. And she said to both of them, what's the best thing about being single, and what's the worst thing about being single? And she went to the married people and said, what's the best thing about being married, and what's the worst thing? The single people said, the best thing about being single is freedom. And the worst thing about being single is lack of intimacy. Anybody relate to mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Survey said, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. She went to the married people and she said, the married people said, the best thing about being married is intimacy. And the worst thing about being married is lack of freedom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very interesting that your marital status would have such a big impact on your freedom and your intimacy. As if your marital status determines your freedom and your intimacy. So why is this so skewed? Why are the results so 
even though everybody can nod and relate to them, is because the freedom that the single people were talking about was freedom of the body. And in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says, what do you want? Freedom of the body or freedom of the mind? For both you cannot have. He comes right out and says, both you cannot have. So if we're looking for some kind of a mix between heaven and earth, where we come into an interpersonal relationship, where we get the best, best of both worlds, the best of the spiritual realm and the best of the carnal realm, okay, tonight, new show, you know, mix and match, you know, let's get the best of both. What the Course is really saying is, you can experience heaven only by giving your full devotion and attention to heaven. By focusing your full attention on the Kingdom of Heaven, you bring it into your awareness. And when your attention is split and you're desiring other things, you get mixed results. And it's very conflictual. So what I've discovered is there's a purpose. When I've joined in this purpose, I've found the intimacy and I found the freedom. But I didn't find either one in personhood, or interpersonal relationships. The survey was looking only to the bodies that were single and coupled bodies. And it was looking for the freedom and the intimacy right where it could never be found. And that's why they were, they were discontent. Both the single people and the married people were saying, we're not fully content. There must be something more. And how does that work with relationships? Well, when I Gave, gave my mind and resources, everything over to the Holy Spirit, then I could see that the body was just a communication device. And I, this body and other bodies were used in a way to be a witness for a state of mind that was beyond this world. I mean, it's, it kind of gets your attention when you come across in this world happy people. You know, don't, even when you're going through your day, it doesn't matter if it's a waitress in a restaurant, or, you know, it's somebody in the butcher shop, or it's somebody here or there. You just, you don't know where it's going to be. But when you find somebody who's strikingly happy, strikingly peaceful, strikingly joyful, it's like, it gets your attention. It's like, oh, I, hi, I would like to get to know you, spend a little more time with you. What's, what's going on uh, in your life? And for me, I've drawn a lot of witnesses like that because, because it's all been about sharing this deep message. People say, how do, you, how do you gain a sense of intimacy without interpersonal relationships? Well, I've been traveling in the parable, 31, year, 31 countries and for 20 some years, and what I found is, in sharing this message, when I would go into countries where they did, I didn't speak the language, I thought, I don't know how that's going to work, because I just, I'm not bilingual or multilingual here, I don't know how this will go over. But even the, the translators that were sent to me, I never went to hire or look to find translators. And some of the gatherings I, I had anywhere from, I think in Argentina there was like 14 translators that were always around me when I did these gatherings, just sent, spontaneously. And I found that as I was letting the Holy Spirit rip through me and pour through me, and they were going and excited, sharing it in Espanol or whatever the, the language was, Mandarin or, you know, German or French or whatever, we were both being used for a very holy purpose. We were both tuned in to that purpose. And there were actually times when we ended up doing simultaneous translations, where both of us were speaking. It was like Pentecost. Mm. It, wa it wasn't a cadence of one and then the other. We were both speaking the same content mm. in different languages and just kind of look, looking at each other in amazement sometimes, mm. because there wasn't really translating going on. We were like mm. doing channeling mm. with two different uh, languages mm. at the same time. Mm. Just like in Pentecost, when everyone was, all, all the languages were being spoken, and the, the joy and the glory. To me, that's intimate. That, that, that is a most intimate experience. Such a feeling of deep connection and love. And then I was paired up with all these different translators around the world, and those were the kind of experiences that we were having. And, yeah, recently was in Belgium, wasn't it, last? Months ago or something, we were in Belgium and that was what was going on. The French, 
in the English. And it was just the glee and the joy of that. We could feel it. Everyone could feel it. It was very deep and intimate. And also a sense of freedom because when you have that, that connection and you're so connected to the Spirit, you do feel free. You don't feel bound to the world. You don't, you're not, your mind's not thinking about how am I going to survive and what's going to happen tomorrow and how am I going to deal with that. You know, the typical things that the egoic mind is in. Your mind is lifted up into a, a realm that's higher than those doubts and fears and concerns. And you're just, you're like, you're just emanating from this higher place. That's the ultimate freedom. Uh, the freedom is, it's not freedom of the body. Uh, there are even those that came before us like Gandhi. You know, Gandhi was quite happy when he was in prison. You know, he wrote most of his writings in prison. You know, he spent decades in prison and he was very, very happy exchanging vegetarian recipes with, you know, the prison. You know, he was, he was really doing what people would say people do when they're not in prison. He was doing in prison. All he was showing us is that it's a state of mind. Prison is a state of mind and that's what the Matrix teaches us too. Morpheus tells him, it's a prison for your mind, Neo, that you cannot smell, taste or touch. A prison for your mind. And now we've come upon the Course and living the Course and found that that is actually the gateway to a free mind. And it's really not, we, I wouldn't say we have an interpersonal relationship in any way. And if you delve deeper into it, you'll find that there's great joy and there's great happiness and freedom. And there's a deep feeling of connectedness and intimacy. But it's far, far, far from what people would call an interpersonal relationship. You know how the Course says, minds are joined, bodies do not. It's pretty blunt. Bodies do not. Well, that's, that's really direct, but we're here to talk about there's an actual freedom and intimacy that, that comes from following and trusting in the Spirit that is not the same equation. It's not following the equations of the ego, which have never succeeded. You find millions, actually billions of people that will tell you they aren't completely fulfilled and content in their life. They want to be, feel more connection. And this is the way. Yeah, I was actually talking to a friend earlier today um, about marriage and uh, there was a sharing of a, a guidance of a, a marriage between uh, two friends living in, a, in one of the community. And it was really funny because one has a very strong reaction to it. And so I was talking with them and, and the words came from my mouth like, you know, I don't see any difference. Like, I already feel married to you because truly this marriage is in mind. And I don't, see, I don't see the difference between this one or that one or that one. It's, it's a state of mind and that's what we want. We want a state of mind of union. We want to feel one with everyone. We want to feel this union and this intimacy. And I feel like I shared with David my experience lately has just been so deep actually in that where um, I would just go for a walk with a friend and I would be able to relate as much to one body than the other where I don't I cannot just identify myself with one more than the other. I feel just so intimate and, uh, and it's a profound experience and it has nothing to do with the body being close or the body knowing each other or uh, it has nothing to do with that. It's just that the mind is so open and it's, the state of mind is so expensive that it's not located somewhere. It's everywhere. So it's the truth is that we are this one mind and there isn't any, any difference between this body or that body or that body or this body. These are just characters, these are just puppets. But the intimacy is not in having a sexual relationship or something like that. It's in the recognition of the truth that we are. We realize that we all share the same mind and that's where the intimacy is, in mind. And it's something actually very scary because I can tell you, uh, in my past, I used sexuality to avoid intimacy, actually. It's like the body was seemingly um, used that way, but 
I never, I never had this profound experience of the intimacy that I'm experiencing now was this recognition. It, it was never there. And so really what the Course is teaching that bodies are, uh, minds are joined, but bodies are not, it's so true. It's like you can, you can live a sexual relationship with someone and your mind is going completely somewhere else and it's just a mechanical act, but there's nothing in it. And what we want truly when we want uh, this experience of making love is this intimacy. And we think we're going to find it there in the form, but it's never there that we're going to find it. It doesn't mean it cannot happen there too, but it's not that that's the experience that you're going to have and that you have to go through in order to live this intimacy. And we were talking about that earlier. It's like we think we want many things in the world because what we want behind it is happiness. We want rest. We want truth. We want to stop seeking for something outside of ourselves. We really, there is a profound desire to just be able to rest and feel so content that you know that there's nothing else that you need in this moment, that you're so full that nothing else exists in this moment. And that's what we, why we look in all those different things, having a great job, having a great car, having nice clothes, having a beautiful body, having what, whatever you want. And, and what we feel at the end when we, we started to look, 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 is, ha, oh, we never found it. It was never there because it's all just tricks that the mind is playing out, making you believe, making us believe that there would be something out there that is valuable. And we have to question all that. We have to start questioning all the value we gave to everything to come to this experience that we truly want, where everything is already in. There's nothing that needs to be, ta that needs to be taken from outside of ourselves. And we really even realize that there's absolutely nothing outside of us, ourselves, and that's why we live this deep intimacy, because truly it's all it's all one mind, and there is nothing else that's ever happening but this experience of one mindedness. A lot of times, I think if we're honest, we start to realize that we have had intimacy associated with communication. Anybody who's been through relationships, friendships, family and everything, you know, where there feels like there's open sharing and open communicating. Hey, how you doing? Great. You know, there's, there's this sense of communication. We feel connected when there's communication going on and when there's no communication, when there's like a sense of dead space or we could say, has anybody had the experience where somebody that you're really close to just disappears from your life, either through death or they move away. It's, it's not so much if they move away and you're doing Skype chats and you're talking and you're emailing and this and this. You're texting each other, they're over on the other side of the planet, you're still getting text messages and everything. It mm -hmm. seems like the intimacy continues even when the bodies are apart, mm -hmm. as long as there's communication. But when there's no communication, hey, how's so and so doing? Mm, I haven't heard from him. Well, when was the last time? You heard from them two years ago. They haven't, they haven't written or spoken to me for two years. You know, it's as if there's a break in the intimacy, a break in the connection. And you know what that is, is that <coughs> in the egoic mind, the communication is seen again between people in the horizontal realm, and that can be broken pretty easily through death, moving away, or you name it. Somebody gets, has hard feelings, feels offended, insulted or something, and oh, well that's it, I'm not going to talk to them. Some of us have heard those words again, mm -hmm. I'm never going to speak to you again. <laughs> How does it feel when a loved one says to you, I'm never going to speak to you again? You know, that's mm -hmm. like, ugh, the death of the connection, the death of the intimacy. But it's only because we've associated egoically communication with words and with the horizontal plane. And what I find with the Course of Miracles is it's saying, well, yeah, that's a problem, but it's not a real problem because God is with you wherever you go. You know, the voice for God speaks to you, guiding you, comforting you, telling you how wonderful and perfect and beautiful you are, just as you are right now, without even having to 
to be different than you are. It's just so gracious and loving. And the way that we get in touch with that voice, which is the voice that ultimately we want to hear, is we have to let that voice speak to us and speak through us. We have to teach what we would learn. We have to give it away to keep it. We have to let the Holy Spirit inspired communication come in us and through us. How does it feel when you write a love letter from the heart? Whoa, your heart is exploding with love and joy. You're just pouring it out in an email where you're communicating with somebody, you're doing a Skype chat, you're sharing on the phone. You feel the love just pouring through you and you feel completely filled up and just engulfed in love and intimacy. And when there's a sense of a block, a sense of hesitation, a sense of doubt, a sense of fear, a sense of holding back, withholding, it feels closed down, it feels contracted. It's almost like your heart is turned in the way where it starts to feel contracted instead of expansive and open. So that's why the, one of the workbook lessons uh, is my happiness and my function are one. When you're in your function, when you're in your Holy Spirit given function, you are guaranteed to be happy. And when you seek for happiness through external means, I'll be happy when my life looks this way, when I have the right partner, the right this, the right that. Whenever I get all the right pictures and the right conditions, in the future sometime, I'll be happy. And then it's almost like a dream you chase that never works out. Even, I was just in Hollywood and, and the thing I love about Hollywood is the lessons are so apparent. Uh, in Hollywood, <laughs> the rest of the world, you know, the rest of the seven billion is trying to survive. And in Hollywood, survival's, you know, not on the mind that much. There's a lot of money, there's big cars, there's big mansions, there's fame, popularity, you know, as the world would say, you know, the Marilyn Monroe factor, you know, famous husband, money being sought at, very sexually attractive, all the things that the world would say, just do these things and you'll be super happy because you have all the right things, you hit all the right buttons, and then depression and suicide. Wow, does that drive home the point. Why is it the people that have the most of the things that the rest of the world is looking for, are not happy. That brings home the lesson, that, that you're not going to find it in the things of this world. Uh, we just watched um, The Great Gatsby. Jay Gatsby, that's a great movie. We actually stayed in the apartment where, um, what's his name? Fitzgerald. Fitzger F. Scott Fitzgerald. We were in F. Scott Fitzgerald's apartment. And we were doing a gathering. They said, this is the mantelpiece where he died. He had a heart attack. We were I was on the spot with that. But we had just watched The Great Gatsby, and Gatsby had it all, you know, in terms of the world. Massive parties, massive wealth, you know. You talk about, if you could find happiness through party making and social things, he was having these huge parties, you know. And yet, as you go on, you see there's a deep sadness and a sense of an emptiness. And he, it's so strong in him that he is actually using all the parties and the mansion across the bay from Daisy, his fantasy. And as long as he believes he can have his fantasy, he pours his whole energy, almost like in a huge way, to draw her attention. And when it doesn't work out with Daisy, you know, it's absolutely devastating. And he ends up, you know, getting shot and Laying at the bottom of a pool. Is there an older version of that movie? Right? Yeah, Robert, Robert Redford. Redford. And then they just made a new one. Yes, Leonardo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. The new version is really quite quite well done too. Because it takes even the the song, some of you remember the Turtles. Imagine me and you, I do. I think about you day and night. It's a nice song, it's a real happy song. Mm -hmm. So happy together. And it takes it and turns it in a psychic, psychotic way. You and me, me and you, <laughs> desperation. <laughs> you know, it takes the happiest song on earth. It's special love. <laughs> it's me and you, I do. You know, it's like groovy. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to be happy together. Where's my partner? Where's my soulmate? <laughs> happy together. Then, you know, it, it comes in and shows you that if it's like the ego's like, and if I don't get what I want, ah, it's it's death. It's murder. It's desperation. It's hate. Special hate. Special love. Special hate. It's what Jesus spends nine chapters teaching us in the Course. So, it's really great to start to see it played out on the big screen or out in Hollywood because the faster you get the lesson, like people, a lot of people I know, they don't like Lesson 128 in the Course. They like a lot of the lessons in the Course, but they do not like Lesson 128. In fact, I did a gathering years ago. I went to Lexington, Kentucky and a friend of mine was in the symphony of the violinist and I opened it up to questions and he said, he raised his hand and he said, well I have to say I'm not doing the workbook lessons of A Course in Miracles anymore. I said, oh you're not? What happened? And he said, well I got to lesson 128. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, well what happened? And he said, I read the lesson. I said, okay what happened then? And he said, something inside of me went, no. No, I do not agree. I object. Uh, this is not where my mind is going. This is not my, where my life is going. And I, I closed the book. That's the last lesson I did. Mm. I said, oh, 129 is so, such a beautiful lesson. <laughs> and he said, uh, what's, what's 129? And I said, beyond this world is a world I want. And Lesson 128 is, the world I see holds nothing that I want. He shut the book on 128. He never did make it to 129. Mm -hmm. Beyond this world is the world I want. Jesus never leaves us hanging. He never takes us to a point of desperation to, you know, it's not going to work out. It's always like he's, he's going that right to the root of the ego and saying, here, let me help you. I'll get the root of the weed out of your mind, the alien, and here's the soft place where this is all heading. He always gives us lots of pep talks. Sometimes he shakes the ego right to the roots. And you feel like you're just totally devastated when you're doing the book, <laughs> doing the workbook lessons, and then he comes in with this soft message to lift you up, say, you deserve so much. You don't, your problem is you don't ask for, for too much, you ask for far too little. You don't believe you're worthy of divine love and you keep praying and asking for a little, just a little bit of this and I'll be happy. Just a little bit, <coughs> just a little bit of that, I'll be happy. So it's, you know, you can see where this is going. We have to really open our minds up beyond the past, beyond the familiar, into a new way of being, a new way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm.